Hello and welcome back to the Religious Studies Project. It is a Monday morning, which means we have a brand new episode for you today. I'm Andy Alexander and joining me today is... Brianne Fallon. It's so great to have you here back in our virtual recording studio doing... Uh, a bookend. Yeah, it's so wonderful to be back. Um, after stepping back as co-editor last year, I did promise that I would be around and here I am delivering a new episode for you. Yes, absolutely. And we are so grateful for that. Can you tell us a little bit about today's episode? Definitely. I had the opportunity to sit down with Daniel Boyerin, who is Taubman Professor of Talmudic culture and rhetoric at UC Berkeley, now retired. And when I interviewed him, he was actually up in Harvard. So it was such an honor to sit down with such an esteemed professor of Jewish theology. We talked about a great variety of things because I feel like perhaps in the past, the RSB hasn't really drawn a spotlight to Judaism. So we spoke a little bit about how Judaism is defined, how there might be a little bit of problem with the certain terminology that we use in regards to the term religion or culture or even race or ethnicity. And then we turn to his new book, um, which is being published by Yale University Press. So it's a really wonderful episode as well, because we also turn to the idea of a humor in the Talmud as well. So I think it's a really eye-opening episode and I really enjoyed sitting down with Daniel. This sounds absolutely fascinating. And I think you're right. We don't have quite as much of a focus on Judaic studies. And so I'm really glad that we've had this opportunity, that you had this opportunity to chat with Dr. Boyer. And um, I can't wait to hear. Let's listen in. Thank you very much for joining us on this episode, Daniel. I'd like to start with the first question. But before we delve into the monograph, I'd like to just give a bit of a sense of the book is set to really revolutionize the study of Judaism. And before we delve into that, I'd like to ask for you, can you give us a sort of overview of how Judaism is commonly defined in religious studies and what are the potential problems with those definitions? Right. Um, obviously in religious studies, Judaism is commonly defined as a religion. And, um, and that is the source of um, immense difficulties. Part of uh, some of those difficulties uh, were actually the stimulus for my thinking and my writing of the of this book. So let me just say, what what are some of the problems? I'll be sketchy now, and I imagine more details will come out uh, later on in the conversation. The, the fundamental problem is that the way we imagine religion is inevitably modeled on one particular religion. Not to put too fine a point on it, Christianity. And even more focused, one could say, Protestantism or certain versions of Protestantism. Now, the point is that there's nothing wrong with Christianity. I'm not, I'm not ascribing any fault or defect to Christianity, nor, certain, nor to Protestantism. But I am arguing that the fit between the notion of faith as being at the center of a cultural formation collective of, of humans doesn't fit many, if not most, of the cultures of the world. I find it um, amusing that Jews are asked frequently to identify themselves as members of the Jewish faith. Now, as most of us know, if we think about it for more than five minutes, uh, people can be very, very engagedly, passionately, um, strongly identified with being Jewish without a shred of faith, right? Now, I, I'm not denying, of course, that there are um, a set of beliefs that are typical of, of the Jewish imagination of the world. What I'm denying is that they are 
what constitutes Jewishness. Whereas sets of practices of different kinds are what bind Jews together. Uh, practices such as the study of Torah and particularly um, the study of the Talmud in many different forms. Practices such as having special languages, not just one special language, but several special languages. Practices such as, of course, the holidays, which are practiced by many Jews who would say that they are atheists. You know, but uh, hearing the chauffeur on Rosh Hashanah, um, even fasting on Yom Kippur, right? Making a Seder for uh, Pesach and getting the family together, building a sukkah in different parts of the world, in different places, more practice, less practice. But these practices constitute the practice, the doings as anthropologists. It. I love that term, right? not, not law, not rituals, but doings, things that we do, including some that we might call ritual, some that we might call law, but not all of them. Um, but the doings um, are what pull us uh, together as a nation and I do use and emphasize the term nation. Before we jump into the the idea of the term nation, I'm just thinking about our listeners, and many of them may have heard of Judaism referred to not as a faith, but but as a culture, rather. And I'm wondering if you could just unpack that in the same way as you did faith just now. Yeah, I think culture is not bad. I mean, as long as we use it in the absolute broadest sense, uh, you know, namely all that a given collective says and does <laughs> communally, uh, what mark the, the practice, the doings of a given uh, group of people. In that sense, it's actually very similar to, uh, to my term doings because I'm understanding doings in the broadest sense. Also, uh, language patterns, things we say, things we don't say, right? Um, Wittgenstein, in German, when he writes in German, he writes Lebensformen, forms of life. When he writes in English, he writes cultures, right? So um, I think that 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 sense of... Laban's form, uh, um, a way of life, is perhaps the uh, the most the most adequate. And that's quite poetic. I, I like that the forms of life, and they can be religious or or irreligious, and everything in between. I think there's something very broad, as you say, about that that encapsulates many forms of Jewish life beyond what a sort of Christian demarcation would put around it of, of what we would expect. I'm, I would like to throw a question at you just completely out of left field, one that we haven't even talked about via email, which is there's a survey that's done in Australia that tries to understand the the form of life of, of Judaism in Australia. And it asks um, Jewish people what they I identify most in terms of their Jewishness. And the number one thing is actually not necessarily one we might think would come up. And that is actually commemoration of the Holocaust. Mm. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Well, Jewish memory and memory of the dead and uh, and memorialization of the dead, and particularly of the dead that we might in some way call Jewish martyrs. Right? The term is not entirely uh, satisfactory, but it comes close. Or the more uh, native term is Jews who died for the sanctification 
of God right. has deep, deep roots in in uh, Jewish practice. There are uh, the um, annual fast of Tisha B'Av commemorates um, several instances of uh, historical instances of both uh, destruction, destruction of the temple, first temple, second temple, uh, as well as uh, massacres uh, uh, of one sort or another. So, so memorializing that is very old. Um, I don't use the term Holocaust because it is again a kind of um, you know um, theological, uh, particular theological um, uh, description. But I, I like the Yiddish term "horven" to destruction, or the Hebrew Shoah. I think that's a good segue, this idea of, of, of definitions and terms, um, Shoah. The other one I'd not heard of before. Could you repeat that one? Orban. 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 It's, it's, it's a Yiddish word derived from Hebrew, and it means destruction. So the destruction of the temple is Horban Abayis. Right, the destruction of the bias of the of, of of the house of the temple, right? And the Yiddish term that developed for the destruction of European Jewry, and not only European, right? I would add, um, is Horban, the the destruction. And I think it's very much to the point because it is a continuation of the memorialization of uh, the other catastrophes and, and, and disasters and uh, massacres and destructions um, in Jewish history. And it's obvious why it would be central, because A, well, not unique, it's certainly the most massive, ma- most massive of massacres um, in Jewish history. And secondly, it's the most recent still. There's still people alive who remember it. Whole generation of the children of people who went through it. It's still very... So that's that's quite... uh, That's not surprising. Uh, I'll tell you something else that you may or may not know. I believe I read heard that after Israel, the greatest number of survivors of the Horban live in Australia. Yes, I've heard that as well. Yeah, so so that also makes it uh, natural that there would be a focus on that within the Australian Jewish community, both those who are in that group and those who are not, but are in close contact with uh, with su- survivors. It raises an interesting point, though, that that would perhaps change the formation of Jewish identity as opposed to other places, that concentration of survivors. Um, perhaps for another time, Let's uh, turn to your book now, Judaism, The Genealogy of a Modern Notion, and talk about what this book is trying to achieve. Let's start off with the idea of how Christianity is really kind of hampering what Judaism can be understood as. It's not Christianity that's hampering, Um, although sometimes it it could be, but it's more... Uh, the kind of self-image that Jews and Jewish institutions have created for ourselves in our reflection back via the dominant ideas of the of the societies we're in, which are Christian for the most part. The Jews of Islam um, are a very important. Uh, topic that I'm actually shamefully less familiar with, not totally ignorant of, but but less familiar. I'm going to give you a very stark example. 
I recently heard a couple of young men, I'd say very late teens or early 20s, 19, 20, 21. And the, the two were, were talking and they agreed that they're not Jewish. Now, the only reason somebody would say they're not Jewish is, of course, if they are, right? So what was the explanation? I listened a little bit more. And it was, I don't believe in God. And therefore, we're not Jewish, right? Now, that is a shocking shift. And I, I've shopped this around among friends, colleagues, family, and they say it's not uncommon to hear young Jews say that they're not Jewish because they're not religious. Um, Now, I think it has until very recently been the case that the sentence, my parents are Jewish, but I'm not, was a shocker. It didn't, it almost didn't make sense. And now it's starting to make sense. And that is a fundamental shift in Jewish self, self-identification, right? Freud, 115 years ago, called himself a godless Jew. But he said, but a very much a Jew, even if he couldn't quite explain it. And now we're acceding to a notion that uh, to be godless is to be not Jewish. Now, when I say we're exceeding, I don't mean that that's the way that Orthodox Jew, Jews see the world or other, or other Jews. I mean, that is the image that is beginning to infiltrate in, into uh, the Jewish world and particularly the, the, the younger generation. So, you know, so uh, we could end up with signs saying First Jewish Church of Adelaide or or something of that, uh, something of that sort. I'm just showing off. I know the names of several towns in in Australia. Yeah. Um, That's why I didn't say Sydney. (laughs) But... um, yeah, so uh, is, is, that's, that's, that's one example. An example of a very different type would be uh, people who think that being Jewish is some kind of a political act of support for the state of Israel and virtually nothing else. Right? And this leads to other other difficulties and complexities, including when um, our esteemed ex-president Trump uh, referred to Jews who were critical of Israel, American Jews who were critical of Israel as disloyal. You know, he, he never identified exactly what he meant by disloyal, but it's clear that he considered that our country is not the United States, even though we're citizens of the United States and I've lived here for centuries, but our real country is Israel. So uh, any kind of chopping up, chopping off of Jewish identity and identifying it with um, one contemporary social notion or definition of collectives is inevitably going to be distorting, some more, some less, some totally destructive. So in order to kind of combat this potentially destructive notion, what terminology would you favour to refer to as the Jewish community? Um, Well, I refer to the Jews as... A diaspora nation. Let's leave community out of here for a moment, right? But because um, it's it's a very loose term, which is uh, you know we talk about the the stock trading community or 
<laughs> the, the bus riding community. So community has really, uh, at least in the United States, uh, become virtually devoid of meaning. Um, and Jewish community particularly um, has come to refer to the opinions uh, of the machers, you know, of the uh, the wealthy and powerful uh, uh, so uh, we'll stay away from community. I, I like the term Jewish collective, by the way. You know, it's an anthropological term, but it, it's sufficiently broad and undefined that it works well. Um, in my next book, which is in press right now with uh, Yale University Press, I argue that the, or suggest, I don't know if I argue, but I suggest passionately that the, the strongest and most positive way of continuing the Jewish collective is by focusing on teaching, teaching of Jewish texts, not religifying them, and certainly not holding them as the property only of we Orthodox Jews, but extending the teaching, particularly of the Talmud. Those who've never studied Talmud, it's like people who've never been to Rome. You know, they, they've heard about it a lot, they imagine it, but they, they haven't really experienced uh, the beauty of the of a the eternal city until they've been there. Um, and I, th I think the Talmud is something like that. It's just so varied, so funny, so grotesque, so surprising. And then for pages on pages, boring, but, it, but boring in a, in a way that becomes interesting also. If somebody gave me quarter of a billion dollars and said, not for me, but for me to use to, uh, to save the Jews, I would look for the thousand best Talmud teachers in the world, Orthodox, not Orthodox, gay, straight, transgender, black, white, and start a kind of an institution in which these great teachers would be able to go out to different places in the world. Something like a Lubavitch Talmud, you know, Talmud institution. In other words, not competing, we don't need to compete, we can all, but Focus particularly, maybe a quarter of a billion would be enough, but, <laughs> but whatever it takes. It's a utopian dream, obviously. It's not something that's ever going to happen. Uh, but it does express, I think, metaphorically at least, what I really value, treasure, and believe would, would make the... Jewish nation continue to thrive. I think that that's a really, I mean, I, I mean, to be kind of in Australia, we would say airy fairy, um, but that image of working together with all of these different people from different backgrounds, as you said, whether they're gay, straight, Orthodox, black, Australian, American, and actually right actually sitting down to actually think about, you know, the passing down from one generation to the next and actually having conversation and thinking about actually sitting down with Talmud and thinking about it and not just leaving it as though it's just something that kind of is something that is stagnant, I think right. is a really amazing thing to think about. Yeah, that's, 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 and, and, you know, on very small scale, I've done very small pilot projects, but I have discovered frequently enough that 
even people who have never had experience of the Talmud, that once one starts teaching and then eyes open up, ears perk up, one of my favorite early students, but I won't mention her name because I don't have her permission, came to California to study Martin Buber's philosophy. So she took a required course in Talmud and today is a very distinguished professor of Talmud. So um, she made her life a life of Talmud. Um, it's, it's like for me, myself, because I didn't grow up in a religious home. I grew up, grew up in a home in which there was a lot of tradition. And, um, and Yiddish uh, spoken by my parents and grandparents. And for me, the first time I began to study Talmud, almost the first day, I compare it to somebody just, you know, giving me a, a, a sugar pill with some strange, unidentified a drug on it that then addicted me for the rest of my life. So, yeah. We have to wrap up soon. There's one thing I would like to ask you before we wrap up, which is I have some colleagues who are very fond of the Talmud. And as you said, there are some parts of the Talmud that are quite funny, which might yes. be a nice place to finish. So would you share with us perhaps one of your favorite, more comical moments in the Talmud? Yeah, well, but <laughs> I'll, I'll tell a little story. Uh, a decade ago, I was invited to give the annual faculty research lecture at Berkeley. There's one in the humanities and one in the sciences every year. So I was invited to give the one humanities. I began my lecture by saying the thesis of this lecture is that the Talmud is a funny book. Five minutes later, I, I looked at very skeptical faces because people do not think of the Talmud as funny. Five minutes later, everybody burst into laughter and I said, I can sit down now. I'm... So the particular uh, story that I told or worked into my lecture on that occasion was of two rabbis who were so fat uh, that a team of, if they met each other and their bellies were touching each other, a team of oxen could walk under the arch created by their, uh, their bellies without touching them. Right? So we're in Rabelais territory here, right? This is, you know, Pantagruel and uh, the, the Talmud retaining its, its very sober spaces. That means their children weren't theirs <laughs> because they couldn't imagine how they could possibly have intercourse with their wives. At which point somebody says their wives were as fat as they were. And somebody else interjects and says, but that makes it worse, not better. <laughs> and the Talmud answers, love compresses the flesh. Or if you want a, a, a different uh, resolution of this um, terrible uh, you know, contradiction, it is that the, the sizes of their organs matched the sizes of their bellies, right? So, as I say, it's, it's Rabelaisian. It, it's the Talmud being unbuttoned. Why it's there and what it means, that's, that's work for scholars. But this and many other uh, stories like that uh, that we find are simply instances of humor strewn all through the Talmud. And um, yeah, that's enough. I think we're running out of time. I think that's a nice 
place for us to finish. And thank you so much for joining us for the Religious Studies Project. And I hope that people are inspired to look at the Talmud more and think about it and in a way that is going to, as I said, inspire people to think about it in perhaps a bit of a different way. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for staying up late to have me. <laughs> thanks, Brianne and Daniel, for this really engaging episode today. And thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. If you'd like to find out more about this episode, head over to our website at religiousstudiesproject.com, where you'll find a transcript and more information about this episode today. Also, head over to social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We'd love to hear what you thought. Please share and like and comment. We love hearing from all of our listeners and continuing the conversation on social media. We hope that you enjoy these episodes and find all of the other resources we provide, like transcripts and job ads, calls for papers, funding resources, to be useful and productive both for your work or in the classroom. And if so, we would really appreciate it if you would consider making a donation, either a one-time donation via PayPal or signing up for a monthly donation as little as $1 a month at patreon.com because it would go a long way in helping to offset some of the costs that go into the production of these episodes and other resources. And until next time, all that's left to say is thanks thanks for for listening. listening. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by Managing Editors Andy Alexander and David McConaughey and Founding Editors Chris Carter and David Robertson. Our features are edited by Savannah Finver and our opportunities digest by Ella Bach. Audio editing by Alex Matthews Video editing by Alison Isidore, podcast transcription by Jason Bartasius, and social media managed by Candice Mixon. Don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon.com, .co.uk, and .ca links, or donating at patreon.com backslash projectrs. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, iTunes, and all other portals. Thanks for listening.